Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Now then, you're welcome along. So we have much to discuss. Marseille beckons in the Heineken Champions Cup. We will have our uh, final lineup this time next week. Semi-finals next weekend. Saturday coming, Leinster host Toulouse at the Aviva Stadium. Three o'clock kickoff. Tickets on sale as of this morning. Uh, Sunday then, Racing will have home advantage against La Rochelle, although the La Défense Arena not available, so it won't be there. That's also three o'clock kickoff time on Sunday, Irish time. Second year in a row, it is Leinster and three French sides making up the final four. Liam Toland is on the line. Hi, Liam. How are you doing, Joe? And Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times. Hey, Jerry. Good, good to be with you, Joe, and you, Liam. So, Munster 24, Toulouse 24 in front of just over 40,000 fans. Amazing atmosphere at the Viva Stadium. Let's work our way backwards for a moment, Liam. We had Anton Dupont and Conor Murray through the middle. We had Ben Healy and Thomas Ramos on the right-hand side, the trickier side. We had Joey Carberry and Roman Intimac on the left. Uh, moments of high tension and also good humour, not least when Intimac thought he had won the entire shootout, only to realise, oh, we go back for the further kick away either way. And then he had to, to turn around and uh, somewhat apologise to Joey Carberry for the uh, premature celebrations. Uh, the Toulouse kicks, to give them credit, because people say penalties are a lottery, there was also a lot of quality in those Toulouse kicks. Yeah, I think... I think for me, the big talking point is that uh, Healy took the kicks on the right and Carberry took the kicks on the left. Now, I thought, regardless of statistics, and I don't know who made the decision, who picks, who slots in where, and the obvious um, uh, Carberry and Healy are both uh, goal kickers. It was interesting that Ramos, who is the official Toulouse goal kicker, took the hardest ones, and Healy, whether he volunteered or was nominated, ended up in it. But I'm pretty sure if Ronan O'Gara was on the pitch, he wouldn't have asked permission. He would have gone and taken the most difficult side. And I was a bit unsure why Carberry, who is the Irish international, and Healy is the player who's coming up, a younger player, statistically may have a slightly stronger goal kicking. And obviously, Carberry missed a couple in real time. But I was surprised that Carberry didn't step up or wasn't allowed to step up or to demand that to, to take those kicks. And there was an awful lot of weight on a young pair of shoulders and I was surprised it wasn't Carberry taking those kicks, to be honest. Did that occur to you, Jerry? No, it happened, but now that Liam mentions it's a fair point. Yep, I hadn't thought of that at all. But yes, Bruno Gar most possibly would have done that. It is the more difficult side, so maybe you give your first joint goal kicker, as Toulouse did, the more difficult angle from the right, and their second choice kicker, the relatively easier angle from the left, being both right footers. So yeah, it's a valid point. Did that same uh, thought occur to you, Liam, as it was uh, Ben Healy taking on the drop goals? And I appreciate, you know, he's had some big drop goals for Munster already, so maybe he's just the better drop goal kicker. But that point about the Irish international and the experience being on hand and not utilised. Well, at these moments, at quarterfinal level, uh, which is an unusual journey we're on this season, I just think you want your best players stepping up and demanding to take ownership of it. And I was thinking of either Sexton or O'Gara, those two guys would say, listen, I don't know what you do, but I'm the guy who got the ball or I'm the guy who works from the touchline. So um, I was just a little bit surprised in that sense. But in real time, when the, when the game is evolving, obviously Ben Healy had his opportunity on the drop goal. He's a young player. He's got a future ahead of him. We know like he's kicked some outrageous goals um, for Munster, and we've seen it in Thoman Park and around, the, around Europe. Um, we know also that Ronan O'Gara struggled in the 19 Cup final against Northampton, so it is not unusual to happen. But when you have your kind of de facto starting Irish out half in the ranks, I was surprised that he wasn't demanding that opportunity to do it. Um, and I think, again, statistics become irrelevant when it comes to the, 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 the penalty shootout because... Um, like it's an enormously different one. Who has been in that environment? Almost no player in the history of the game has had to go through that. But what's different on the pitch is that normally in a pitch, when a try is scored and you convert from the touchline or even the position that Ben Healy had, he might have been winded 20 seconds earlier. He's in the ebb and flow of the game. It's an entirely different way of kicking when you are, everyone's chatting, everyone's talking, you step up, It's your tempo is totally different. And that's where your experience comes in. Now, the point, of course, is that these players don't have that experience, but you want your most experienced guys. You want your Michael Jordan to say, look, you can throw it to whoever else, but I'm the guy taking the throw. I'm the guy taking the kick. 
I suppose, Jerry, and maybe this has been a touch too critical, but it, it, the thought occurred to me as well about Carberry, both in terms of the shootout and, and which side he was kicking from. And also, to an extent, during real time when Healy took on both drop kicks. And I kind of thought, it's, uh, maybe they've chatted about all this beforehand, maybe not. But in O'Gara and in Sexton, we had a certain personality type. And Carberry, no right, no wrong, but he is a different personality type. He doesn't seem to get his elbows nice and sharpened and, 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 and budge his way in there and say, Healy, step aside. Not, his, not, not in his makeup, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, perhaps not. Although, you know, Ben Healy has a proven reputation from the moment he broke into the Munster team for landing clutch kicks, be they long range penalties or drop goals. And he's got a he's got the bigger boot, there's no doubt about it. So like when he went for that penalty from inside his own half in the last minute of, of regulation time, you can understand why he went for that one as well. He is the out half, he's in that position. The thought occurred to me, Joe, I don't know Liam agrees with me or not, is that when they went for the drop goal an extra time, I just wonder if Peter Amani had still been on the pitch, if Conor Murray had still been on the pitch, if Joey Carby stood at half, like that's your your intelligentsia, your six, nine and ten that started the game, that's they're your leaders on the pitch. Might they have gone one, two, three more phases and tried to get closer to the, the post? Like if you remember when O'Gara landed the drop goal to beat Northampton many years later of 40 plus phases in Tolman Park, yeah. they showed an incredible um, patience then, Munster. And I just wonder, had they a bit more experience on the pitch then at 6, 9 and 10, might they have um, shown a bit more patience and gone to the post a couple of phases later, closer yeah. in. Alan Quinlan made that very point this morning. He felt they took yeah. it a bit early as well. Yeah. Iro- ironically, Jerry Healy struck the more difficult kick from further away, much better than the one which was closer. I, 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 I wonder, was he maybe uh, a yard or two too far forward? Could have been a touch deeper? Because he, he seemed to rush that initi- the, the closer kick. Yeah, perhaps so as well. Yes, again, that's possibly true. It's funny, isn't it? Like O'Gara, apart from that Northampton final and Twickenham, when you you know you learn from your mistakes, you learn from the bad days, and they make you better in future days. And if you think about it, O'Gara's reputation so much is built on clutch kicks, Grand Slam and Cardiff, that Northampton kick, so many over his career. And uh, I think he landed one a week after Northampton, didn't he? In the last kick of the game in Castor in overtime as well to win that match. And some some of his teammates made a joke when the plane was landing. Let Rodge land; he can land anything. Um, that he JJ Hanman missed that chance to beat Rossing in the home game in Tolman Park, which was a draw two or three seasons ago. When he otherwise he played brilliantly and floated that pass and nailed a right hand touchdown conversion. And just feel for them because if JJ had nailed that kick and certainly if Ben Healy had nailed the drop goal at the weekend, they'd be heroes, wouldn't they? Both times. It's what pressure does, I suppose. That's the enthralling aspect of sport yeah, yeah fine margins I suppose uh, Liam it's to Munster's credit in many respects that they were within striking distance against a side as good as Toulouse the overall game then up until extra time 24 points apiece what about the Munster performance allowed them to be in this position well in the first instance Joe I haven't enjoyed a weekend of rugby as much as I have this weekend it was phenomenal like the tries th- across the board uh, and I think Munster did, we've talked about a new stock in the last few weeks, the importance of rewarding your, your supporters. And I think the Munster performance in the first instance rewarded everybody who went to a lot of trouble to be at that. And it was the first fixture maybe in a while that they did so. Um, you can see quite a change in the game plan that uh, Munster employing. Um, in the, they clearly recognised that they were playing against monsters so they look really good when they upped the pace and kept the pace moving. The challenge they had at times was that it put pressure on their own skills and their own subtle decision making at times when they could have really eked out a couple of extra scores, you know, two, very subtle 2v1s and that. But there was a variety in the kicking game. Obviously, Conor Murray's box kicking, and we know how good that is. Um, at out half, then Carberry was kicking, but he was doing a kind of a cross field box kick. They were chopping and changing their routine. De Alande was carrying with some ferociousness. And their defensive line was ridiculous. It was phenomenal. To the point that you'd argue that Toulouse were very, very wasteful of their opportunities. Um, the scrum is going to be its own little kind of uh, um, ecosystem to discuss. And when Munster started, obviously Munster Toulouse, 18 players or 16 players starting the pack. And at one time, Toulouse looked really, really strong. And then you started chopping and changing personnel 
you know, Ryan for Archer, etc. And it made subtle differences. A Hearn came on and that sort of stuff. So it's very, very difficult to know. And at, at one point, then Munster uh, started in the ascendancy. So the scrum certainly is a talking point that needs needs obviously uh, corrective uh, action. You look at the starting side is is down Orgy Stamen, is down Ty Byrne, is down. Um, uh, Kilcoin, and you kind of go, wow, those guys would make a difference as well. But there was a there was an attempt to play the ball at pace from inside their own half, and had they been a bit more patient with that process, and they drilled a lot of balls along the deck, not all, not even 50-50s, they kind of gave the momentum back to Toulouse. I think they let Toulouse off, I don't know, maybe six or seven times when they were building a little bit more patience, and I think they might have got better reward. But there was Certain, certainly an awful lot of really good stuff yeah. in what we saw that would bring that crowd back again and bring me back again to watch them. Well, that's good because I felt you were very disillusioned with the whole thing a few weeks ago and felt their style of play was, I think, in the dark ages was the phrase you used and you were almost despondent. In a perverse way, Jerry. sometimes, I mean, it's, it's, it, this is the inverse of other seasons where we've watched Munster play better rugby and then in the big games they've almost reverted to type and gone to one-out runners and been beaten. They seem to have spent a season being criticised for their style of rugby and then on the big day against Toulouse, they went for it a bit more. Maybe if they were a bit more practised at that style of rugby and less risk-averse for a lot of the season, they might have taken those more subtle opportunities Liam mentioned. Yeah, maybe. I think Munster played some good rugby this season at times, not consistent. Like, you know, you think of the Scarlet's performance away, you think of uh, a couple of their European performances, most, most notably Wasps away. Um, you think of... Uh, the extra at home performance, the first half up in Ulster. I thought they came into this um, game on a pretty good run, run of momentum and playing good rugby and there was good shape in their attack. I thought the other thing they did very well in their terms of their game plan against Toulouse was, yes, they were playing against bigger men and they varied their kicking, but they kept the ball in the pitch for as much as they possibly could to really try and run. That's what they had to do. They had to run a, they run this juggernaut around the pitch as much as they could, keep the ball in play. And I thought, you know, they had, they had some joy out of that. And... They were a little bit unlucky in many respects. I think when you look back on over the concept of the game, they scored three tries apiece. The scrum was huge. There's no doubt about it. The two scrum penalties, which led to Toulouse's first incision and then a scrum advantage for their first try. Um, they did they did iron out some of those issues, definitely, particularly when Arnold was sin binned. I thought he might well have been red carded. You know, another referee might well have red carded him because it was a late tackle on Simon Zebo, which none of the official, four officials mentioned, the fact that it was late. And he also lifted him above the horizontal. And, you know, it's a fraction, his back hits the ground a fraction of a second before Zebo's head bangs into the ground. And then he follows through with the shoulder as well. I thought he was very lucky to stay in the pitch. Mm. And that could have seen, of course, Toulouse down to 14 men. And then you look at the chances that they, that they missed through the drop goals and penalties. And what's more, I think, looking back in the video, like, you see Maxime Medar come on early in the second half. Toulouse are a class club, brilliant club in many, many respects. I remember all the way back in 2000 in Bordeaux, I think it was, that when they applauded Munster off the pitch, took their defeat magnificently in the semi-final. And um, they just, you know, they're a class club in many respects, but Medar is being helped off heavily limping with his left uh, thigh heavily bandaged. And he's limping off the pitch, but he happens to be going for an HIA. Um, so which allows Fusak back onto the pitch, which means Toulouse can see out the last eight minutes of normal time and extra time with 15 players, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. So I think uh, I think Munster will feel a bit of grief. That clear out on on Peter Armani um, that led to him being departed. I don't think that was the cause of the injury, but clearly Romain Entermark comes into the side and it's not penalised. Um, and that leads to the line out from which um, Toulouse scored their third try, equalising try. And most of all, of course, losing Peter Armani with... 62 minutes up at the clock and they're leading by 10 points and he was playing so so well as well as he played against Exxon the first match he's been inspirational for them and that was a big loss in terms of his presence on the pitch and leadership as well wasn't it so they were a little bit unlucky Munster like you know the 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 the, the old lament about them going a decade without a trophy will carry on now and you know they're, they're so close but not quite good enough to beat the best are they not well like to lose the reigning champions, they won it last year and they beat had to beat Munster 40-33 when Munster were disadvantaged by not having the game in front of a crowd at Thoman Park. This time the crowd seems to have been absolutely outstanding, a bit like Welford Road, it was 5,000 short of capacity, which shows you you don't have to have a full house for it to be an electric atmosphere, the singing and the chanting and the colour. And it was just a brilliant, it looked a brilliant day in the Aviva and 
but you wonder still, you still have to wonder a little bit if it was played in a 27,000 capacity Tolman Park with the credit just that bit close to the pitch where it's just that bit more of a cauldron might have made a slight bit of difference. There, if, a lot of laments for Munster in this one. It's going to be a really tough defeat for them to take and they'd be, it'd be a hard watch them next week and I would say it'd almost be an impossible watch and they probably need a break now definitely for a week. Yeah, Liam, to Jerry's point, do you come away from Saturday thinking, oh, maybe Munster are a bit closer to the top table than we might have thought? Well, I suppose the, one of the reasons you, you kind of quoted me there accurately a couple of minutes ago, and one of the reasons I was pretty dejected is because it was a sunny Saturday evening uh, when they entertained Leinster a few weeks back. Uh, COVID was gone, and there was this opportunity to set a real marker. And I felt they, they didn't set down that marker, and their game plan wasn't quite asking enough questions and there wasn't a ferociousness about how they approached the game. We saw huge elements of that against Toulouse, but you can't just turn the the tap on and off. And I think if you look at the four sides uh, have gone through to the semi-final, they're the best four sides. If you look at the the quarterfinals, I think there's elements of what Munster were doing was really, really, really impressive. Now they have to add a couple of layers onto that. And all of a sudden, if they can unshackle themselves of the the phase play that they had been playing and a heavy realization on our on the box kicking there's lots of talent in that team it seems that it has been shackled for season after season after season between the various different coaches and they're the rewards that rugby teams are getting when they do entertain that style of game and i think that style of game will suit the likes of carberry you get to see maybe the better side of him as opposed to the the fixed uh, side that we saw in in the in the kicking aspects of the lot i think there's huge amount to and and the the structure the management has changed and you can see that that's a different game that they're played at the weekend than i've seen over the course of the last season or so It was ferocious, yes. It had all the elements of a great monster ferocity, but there was elements of a game plan that's bridging the gap to the to the modern teams. And I think there's a lot to be a lot to be very hopeful for. Well, there's no doubt when you look at the four semi finalists, it's fairly obvious what style of rugby is to the fore in Europe right now and across the game right now. I mean, Jerry, we'll never know really, but you'd love to be on the inside of the camp now and get a feel for whether or not this this new, more expansive style is this the Graham Roundtree style and his voice is carrying that bit more weight now and we're going to go this way or if it's just been a natural move Munster would have made either way we don't know I don't expect you to know but it's a question I had I have to say well I don't know like you're right I don't can't possibly know but I would have thought it was more the latter than the former okay. I think too much credence has been given to the fact that Brain Roundtree's confirmation as an next head coach has had this galvanizing effect on the squad I think the one thing I've learned from all the Zoom call with all the Zoom with all the Munster players this season of the Munster coaches is how tight knit they are. Mm. Maybe it's because of all the outside noise and the critical outside noise. Maybe it's because of the South African trip and being divided into three and the way they responded against Wasps. Um, maybe most of all, perhaps it's the reaction to defeat against Connacht in the new year. But they seem incredibly tight and together, and on, they were on this journey and this path towards playing this kind of rugby. Anyway, I personally think, but I don't know. You'd imagine this is what Stephen Larkin would have wanted as well. And uh, it's such a shame for them that they're not going to sign off with, by going a little bit further in Europe. Imagine a semi-final against Leinster that truly... And, you know, to go, I don't think there's any shame in the way they went out on Saturday at all. Like, yeah. for only the second team in the history of the competition to go out in a penalty shootout. I mean, it's better than a toss of coin, but it's still un- unsatisfactory. It's better than having different players doing all the kicks. So I think it was Martin Williams missed for Cardiff the last time it happened to Flanker. Yeah. He should never have been put in this, that position. At least we were putting three goal kickers per se in that position last Saturday so I think that was a, a better penalty shootout system but still no shame in the defeat and yeah it'll be interesting how they rally now um, because you know they've got a big game against Leinster on Saturday week they've got a chance to get a home quarter final potentially even a home semi final and getting all the way to the URC final and uh, like I said they'll need this week to regroup definitely they couldn't have gone out you think about Ulster that we we in Irish rugby, we've got a huge love affair with the Heineken Champions Cup, much more so than the comp- the, league, the basic league competition, which is the URC, and previously been the Pro 14, the Pro 12. And I think it's both a positive and a negative. It's a positive when they go on progressing. It's a negative when they go out. I was up in Belfast when Ulster hosted Munster a week after they went out in their epic two-legged tie with Toulouse. And there was empty seats everywhere. There was only one attempted chant of stand-up for the Ulster man that came about 35 minutes into the game. 
you, there was just this palpable hangover feel. Yeah. And you could imagine if Munster were playing a URC game at home next Saturday or Sunday in, in either Thoman Park or in Musgrave Park, there would be that same sense of a hangover. So they need the week off for sure and then have a crack off Leinster and see how they go in the URC. But it's the one competition they can aim for now. But mm-hmm. at least uh, at least we have one Irish team in the semis. I mean, imagine if it had been the third time in 16 years that there was no Irish team. That would have been a tough watch for all of us. Well, for sure. On Peter Amani, by the way, it was interesting. Sam Warburton said in commentary and BT, he's playing the best rugby mm-hmm. of his career. And it would be remiss of us not to mention Munster at the breakdown. 19 turnovers in total and had some great moments at the breakdown. So they, they did a lot right. Liam, just with a view to next year, Mike Prendergast coming in, Roundtree is in, we have Dennis Leamy, I'm sure taking a few interesting bits of information from Leinster down to Munster and that's no harm as well. With a view to what they need to bridge the gap between quarter or semi-final and making a European final, you mentioned the scrum. Uh, I mean, the back line looked okay, you'd have to say. Are you, if they're going into the market and Roundtree was told by David Nusifor, listen, one, two signings here, and that's that's your limit. Where do they need to make a signing? Uh, I say all across the back line, uh, and I don't mean that. But you, you, I'm not suggesting the starting back line on Saturday is to be is to be jettisoned. Not at all. But like serious competition for places with people who can play at that level and execute skills at that level. Like we saw a ferocious defensive effort. You know, Peter Manny leading in the charge, but they're they're all that's almost taken for granted. That's a baseline. So you're, how can players, and I'd be interested to know the type of conversation Roundtree had with Mike Prendergast, because watching Mike Prendergast's teams uh, from when he started in France, I don't know, what is it, six years ago, yeah. whenever, like you could see a counter-attacking game that was there. You know, it would pop up every now and then, and you kind of go, well, that's Mike Prendergast's team, and there's a full-back counter-attacking. So he's been doing, he's been encouraging that within the confines of the top 14. So it'd be very interesting to know the conversation that Roundtree had when he when he said, listen, I want you to join the team. I'm sure the first question Mike Prendergast would have been asking is, well, what's our attacking strategy? Am I going to get an opportunity to encourage a higher level of, of attack? Am I going to get an opportunity to maybe select players I think would best fit that? There's certainly with Dale and Farland midfield, these are two big bruisers. Are they the best distributors of the ball? Are they the best centre partnership to get? Now, we know Dale Andy is going. Sure. But that style of player, are they the best players to maximise the back three? And you look at like the back three that started with Zebo, like how many <laughs> seasons has he got at that top level? Where is the next Conway, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a need to look at. So Mike Prendergast, I'm sure, would have to be brutally honest and say, are these players, as they present, going to be able to play the style of game I want them to play or do I have to adapt the style of game I want them to play mm. to them because they can't and that's we don't know yet what Mike but if you're asking Mike Prendergast I, I'd hope that'd be one of your first questions Yeah fair enough even yesterday chatting to Rob Carney on Virgin Jerry he was saying if Munster's attack is to match what we have in the semi-finals what jumped out to him is the skill set of the forwards they're going to have to acquire or else upskill either way they're going to have to have some ball playing forwards yeah, and you know, I, I said this in the build up to the game. It was a striking feature of the last 16 defeat by Toulouse in Tumman Park last season. And again, to a degree, last Saturday, perhaps not quite to the same extent, but like Toulouse can bring off the bench Cyril Bai, Grand Slam winning loose head, uh, Piato Movaca, Grand Slam winning hooker, David Ainu, this young bull of a US Eagle tight head, with Julian Marchand starting and Netty and Aldegheri. Like, then you. Like Munster don't have that that caliber of young, dynamic, international frontline front rowers, both starting and off the bench. Mm. And the scrum was a huge factor in that first half and getting to lose back into the game, as we discussed already. Contrast with Welford Road and Leinster have signed Michael Alatoa, and they can bring him on um, as a replacement for Tyke Furlan, and he wins two scrum penalties against Ellis Genge. And what a good signing he's proved as a backup to Tyke Furlan. And I just think maybe if Munster could make a sign, it would be somebody of that, of that ilk. I mean, I know Josh Witchley had a fantastic game around the pitch. He really did. It's just, his one, it's just that one-handed catch and the build-up to Alex Kendall and try alone. But in lots of other ways as well around the pitch, he was excellent. Niall Scannell, I think, is playing some really good rugby. His darts are absolutely magnificent at the moment. But they were missing Dave Kilcoyne and they've sold James Cronin. I just think if they could strengthen up in one area, I'd like to see them strengthen the front row myself. OK. Well, if you're looking for more Munster Talk, Red 78 with Alan Quillen and Nate Briggs will be out tomorrow. 
available on the OTB Sports app or on podcast. We're going to take a short break. We do have the prospect of Toulouse now against Leinster on Saturday. We're going to chat about that with Jerry and Liam in just a moment. Our rugby coverage here and off the ball with thanks to Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Back in one moment. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Now you're welcome back. Liam Tolan, Jerry Thornley with us, uh, picking our way through Heineken Champions Cup quarterfinals and, of course, quick turnaround to the semifinals. We were just talking Munster Toulouse, focusing more on Munster for obvious reasons, Liam. Where are Toulouse? Because that was, I think, if you count that as a draw, that means they are now one away win in nine. I think. Where are this Toulouse versus the version you saw around this time last year? I think to, to answer that, if you compare them to the opposition next weekend, Leinster are the best one minute or by 80 minutes team in the competition. And I think Toulouse are probably the best of the teams if you just take out a little section because they can drift in and out of the game. Uh, I think that they have shown some extraordinary skill sets, but they were unbelievably wasteful. Uh, even in the opening three or four minutes, Flamé, Flamé, the open side number seven, had a 2v1 on Conor Murray. He just brutally passed the ball too early. Conor Murray did brilliantly and made a cover tackle, but that should have been a try. So there, there's loads of little examples of how wasteful Toulouse are. And I just don't think they're um, able to show enough discipline in their game plan when the opposition are asking questions. And I'm not so sure that the team that they were last year and the table in their domestic competition would prove that and their performances in Europe would prove that as well. So I, I'm not so sure that they can live at pace. And when Munster kept real pace in the game, they struggled. And as soon as they could dictate the scrummaging play and go from phase to phase, then they look better. And then they could spring into life when it suited them. So I'm sure they won't get that luxury at the weekend. And I'm not so sure that they're the same side they were 12 months ago. Jerry for Leinster, three week break, pitching up against battle hardened Leicester. We wondered how uh, Leinster would initially start off with they hit the ground running and then, geez, at half time, 20 nil. Embarrassing for Leicester, really. And I, I, I presume Leinster very impressive across that 40. Yeah, hugely. It was stunning being there. Like it was a real proper Anglo Irish European knockout tie, everything on the line. Again, it wasn't quite full, but the atmosphere was rocking. They're very like a French crowd. They're howling at the referee within the first 10 or 15 minutes for penalties and decisions. You know, 10,000 people chanting in unison offside. It's quite intimidating for officials. And I don't know whether it affected Matthew Reynal or not. Um, they had, he, he, he was their pantomime villain, along with uh, Johnny Sexton. That's the pantomime crowd had their two pantomime villains. But at fairness, they did afford to Sexton utter silence for goal kicks, which was good to see. But it was a great atmosphere at Leinster. You know, we saw them do this before earlier this season. They had an enforced four-week break before they put 80-odd on, on Montpellier and went to direct the following week and scored another 60. So we do know that when Stuart Lancaster gets them in camp and Leo Cullen for three weeks and they prepare single-mindedly for one match, one match only with all their frontliners, they're going to be well set. And I think they were well set. And they had a brilliant game plan, which they carried out very well. They knew the aerial bombardment was coming. Leicester kicked the ball more than any other team in the Premiership this season by a distance. They kicked the ball more than any other team in the Champions Cup by a distance. In the first game against Bordeaux away, they kicked the ball out of hand 58 times. It's been, it was over 200 going into the game. In actual fact, I think Leinster kicked out of hand slightly more than Leicester. So they, were, they weren't going to try and run the ball unnecessarily from their own half. They manned the backfield. They were brilliant in the air. Lowe and Ke Hugo Keenan just never makes a mistake and Jimmy O'Brien. Mm. And then they picked their moment. That was a key difference between the sides and particularly in the first half. They picked their moments to go wide, whether it was from James Lowe marking the ball, quick tap, Jameson Gibson Park releasing Hugo Keenan up the wing. I think that eventually led to their first try. Johnny Saxon floated out that long skip pass to Jimmy O'Brien, makes a huge break up the left touchline. 
Leicester, by comparison, were much more um, programmed and you know ig ignored all opportunities to counter and put the ball up in the air quite a lot. When they did make encro encroachments into the 22, which in a smaller, tidy pitch, where you get a few scrum penalties in midfield, you're going to do, and they probably did a bit too much for, com for Leinster's comfort. But even then, Leinster's defence in the first half, particularly with some great defensive sets, and you saw that double turnover that Johnny Sexton and James Ryan performed and it was great to see Ryan play 76 minutes and you know make his two line out steals and put in a dozen tackles and just great to see him back and playing that well and I just thought they they were almost flawless in the first half and deserved their 20 nil even the try they get they get in the corner once and they almost set up a dummy ball and then Josh van der Fleer peels around the open side and plows through Harry Potter and scores I just and then you know Robbie Henshaw who looks absolutely primed for a huge end of season now yeah. I was just his seventh star for Leinster this season, and he just looks he's got, like he's got a lot of rugby in him, and that's an advantage. I do think that you know Leinster have over Leicester and might have over to lose as well. If you look at their minutes, their leading their frontline players have much less minutes on the clock this season than their English stroke Leicester counterparts or their you know to lose stroke French counterparts. And I think they only have one week to prepare for this, but I also think they'll be better for the game last Saturday in many respects that they'd come on for that. They won't, they, and maybe it was no bad thing. That they had a tough second half and they had to endure some pain and we'll give them more to go over through through on the video and most of all while like to lose they lamented the cancellation of one of the games the pool stage denied them a chance of getting home advantage in the quarterfinals going to welford road and winning in welford road against a team that hadn't lost at home in a year and were 15 out of 15 at home this season that's got to be brilliant for them and maybe even better for them than if they just had a routine home win mm, totally agree on henshaw you mentioned it last week that was your sense of him and he does look like a fella who is still very much in his peak and bursting with energy, endless energy and power at the moment. And uh, he had an incredible game. And that's not to mention Gibson Park, who'd wow. man How of the match as well, you know. Yeah. And Ross Maloney in pretty eye-catching form, you know, coming good alongside James Ryan. So it's funny, uh, Liam, sometimes it's very instructive when you watch games back to back and you flick over and it's you, there's a more ready comparison because there was a degree with Munster and Toulouse, very admirable degree, by the way, of like you know, mistakes and ball hitting the deck and hot potato and, and, and trying things and pushing skill sets to, to limits. And then BT flicks over to Welford Road and you just see Leinster with complete precision at this unbelievable pace, boom, 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 in the 22. And they did just look a different level. Well, they did so off 31% territory and 46% possession. So, like, if you can go and overwhelmingly dominate the opposition... Of those statistics, that's now over the 80-minute period. You're 100% right. And what I really, really like about Henshaw is, if you didn't know Henshaw's name, you wouldn't necessarily be picking him out. He goes about his business with such a degree of simplicity and the effect, the impact he has. If you're a back row player playing with Henshaw, uh, leading up, I can't remember which try, when he took a ball off the line out, and he just, he just went in and out line, uh, he carried about three defenders, sucked in three or four defenders. The Leinster backer or whomever is set up in the next thing, everything is going forward. And there's no massive bouncing. He finds the space. He can find a slight weak shoulder and he just powers through. I and mean, when you see someone like Indola who comes on, he's all about just blasting guys out of the way. And that's not Henshaw's way. He can do it if it's a terrible ball he can carry. But I really like how he... He subtly finds those little spaces. His line on receiving the ball gives him a chance, and then he can shift his point of contact, typically out to in, and all of a sudden he's pumping his legs. And as a back row forward, you're going, wow, I can see the number in his back, and I'm just running. And maybe he, he might even get an offload. But worst case scenario, we're setting up a really quick ball. And when you've got Gibson Park, you both mentioned him, when you got him flying, everybody knows you got to get into place very quickly because that ball, now, he does get... In lots of games, particularly in our domestic league, Gibson Park, it's an awful lot of really good armchair rides, right? Yeah. So the challenge for uh, Toulouse is, can Toulouse do to Gibson Park what Munster did to DuPont? Mm. And that's that's going to be a real thing. But if, if Gibson Park can play, he has the skills. I've been saying it for seasons. He looks like a guy playing tip rugby on his local beach at home. There's, he's not burdened by an Excel spreadsheet of how to play rugby. He gets on the ball and he does it with such speed and then the precision of what the teammates are doing and the number on the back is irrelevant and that probably becomes a relevant discussion about Munster. You mentioned Ross Maloney. I've been banging his drum for a long time. He just doesn't get the rewards that because he's not a Galactico, he's not a Lions test player. That guy is such an important 
impact and element of how Leinster run because he never wastes a moment. He's always contributing. And then you got all the great, great players. That are in it. But to do it on 31% territory, 46% possession, boy. And like it's outrageous the return they get from their 22. When they visit the opposition 22, it's like we're not coming out here without at least three points. Jerry, do Leinster strike you as in any way a different team or an improved team to last year? And if so, how? Yes, um, in their in their physicality up front, in their pack, in their ball carrying. Um, you look at Ross Maloney and Josh van der Fleer, they wouldn't have been known as proficient, particularly proficient ball carriers up until the last couple of seasons. But whatever work they're doing with their skills coaches and with Lancaster in their UCD High Performance Centre, the, the, the speed with which they come onto the ball, their timing, the side angles with which they run, the footwork before contact, whatever, like they've made themselves into proficient ball carriers. But then you've also got Andrew Porter in switching over to loose head effect, you've come in a new signing. He now starts games rather than just finish them. The emergence of Dan Sheehan. So you've got Sheehan and Keller vying for number two, one replacing the other. Michael Alatoa as a backup, as I mentioned already, to type Furlong. So they're, they're exceptional in the front row all across the board. And then you've got Caelan Doris emerging as well as a major, major ball carrier as well. Like I think he had most carries of any player on the pitch the weekend. And his tackle count was very high as well. He's a fantastic rugby player that probably would have made the Lions tour last 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 summer if it hadn't been for his concussion issues over the course with the ruled him out of the Six Nations. So yes, I think they are a better pack than they were a year ago for sure. And Gibson Park, like Lowe, his performance graph just keeps rising and rising and rising. Just shows you that you can get unpolished, relatively unpolished gems from the New Zealand system and make them into better players in the Irish system, which is certainly what Leinster have done with both of these guys, like Gibson Park, I think he's 31, and just keeps getting better and better. He's almost become the heartbeat of this team. Mm. He's brilliant in broken play, but his speed to the breakdown and his ability to get the ball away as quick as he does is the reason that Leinster are able to play at such a ridiculously high tempo compared to nearly anybody else. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think they're, I think they're a better team in several respects than a year ago. Mm. And Liam, they seem to have total trust in Ross Byrne to finish games now, to the point where you would say, regardless of the score with Toulouse, whether it's 20 points apiece and very, very tight, or whether they're chasing the game and Toulouse have, have nudged ahead, you would still very much anticipate 60, 65 minutes, Johnny Sexton will come off. Yeah, and, and I think that's a huge part of the weekend story, actually, Joe, is the there's definitely a no panic DNA in the Munster. They've earned a culture of no panic because it seems if they go behind, in most cases they don't to go ahead, but if they go behind, there's never, they, they, they can trust in their skill set, they can trust in their decision making and their leadership. And most importantly, they can trust in their bench. Their bench is outrageous. Like Sheehan, Healy, uh, just to name two, Ruddock. Like Ruddock is a phenomenal player and you go down through and then you come to Ross Byrne. I've always felt Ross Byrne has been given a very, very um, unfair criticism because he's in the shadow of Johnny Sexton. Uh, Ross Byrne, I'm pretty sure if Ross Byrne, if Sexton was out injured and Ross Byrne was, was selected, I'm sure the players would be aware that Sexton is out, but they wouldn't go, oh my God, we've no chance, because I think that he has earned that within his team as of the bench. So, And then when you look at the lesser games and you see that the new up-and-coming players that come in, like the expectation on their skill set, their decision-making, their execution is streets ahead of anyone else in, in the Irish setup, we'll say. So it's a very, very impressive outfit. No panic, a very calm culture, and there's all the elements are flying. So like Toulouse, when you think of, like they have to go back home, they have to come back to Ireland, they have, uh, you know, they have all that travel. How are they going to take on? It's going to be fascinating. They'll really want to slow the ball down and they'll want to get Gibson Park in all sorts of trouble. If they don't, I think this Leinster side, I'm not suggesting they'll whitewash Toulouse, but it's going to be very difficult for Toulouse to slow them down. No, but I mean, that, it's very interesting you say that because even Jerry, um, well, I, I, I was talking to somebody who was talking to somebody else who's kind of on the inside of Toulouse and, and their sense was a lot of the Toulouse players aren't fit, actually, which is, I mean, and I guess by dint of their size in certain instances and, you know, somewhat surprising given the way they came back against Munster and managed to come back against Ulster. But fitness was a concern of theirs, actually. But Alan Quinlan this morning, he mentioned fitness as well. And uh, akin to Leem's positivity, Alan was saying he can really see Leinster winning this game by 15, 20 points here. What's your sense? Well, like I said earlier, I do think Leinster players are better managed and they're fresher. Um, and I think the... 
think the nine Toulouse players or whatever it is that were involved in the Grand Slam or the 10, um, they have a lot of minutes. Uh, they've been going to the well a lot this season. They had a big November as well, beating the All Blacks. I know Ireland did as well, but they're just, they don't play as many men- matches for Leinster and the URC as do the frontline Toulouse players play in the top Couture's. And they're struggling to make top six. They had a huge big game against La Rochelle a week before the quarterfinals. They've been going to the well consistently every week. And I think maybe they're just running on empty a little bit by comparison to Leinster players who are just that little bit fresher towards the end of the season. They'll need to be, because by my understanding, is, my guess is that none of the Toulouse players will be taken on the summer tour to Japan that France are undertaking. Whereas, of course, Leinster will be bulk suppliers for the three-test, five-match tour to New Zealand. So they've still got a lot of rugby to play this season. So just as well, they're fresh. And that's why they are managed accordingly. But I do think that... Um, yeah, I think a really good high tempo ball and play conditions like last Saturday, hopefully, while it might, you know, Toulouse love the sun on their backs as well. I think Leinster would want that just as much as they would. And um, yeah, I, I, I do I do have a strong feeling that Leinster are going to make the final again this year. And it might well be a, a reprise of last year's semi final against mm. Ron Nogara's La Rochelle and the, uh, and the figure of Will Skelton looming large for the final. <laughs> <laughs> Will Saturday be a sellout, Jerry? Well, they've, all, they've sold over 25,000 tickets already. Just today? In a day, wow. In a day, which is a great response from the Leinster season ticket holders alone. So I would have thought, like, when they last had Toulouse here, was it three, four seasons ago? In the semi final, they got 42,000. I think you had Virgin Media that afternoon as well, so it wasn't terrestrial television. But they had three weeks to sell it. I don't remember ever once where, this, with indecent haste, the tournament has become. The knockout stage has been compressed into the quarterfinals and semifinals being just a week apart. So you literally only have five days to sell these games. Yeah. It's just, it's a nonsense. But that's because the PRL and the LNR are, provide are two thirds of the EPCR and they give primacy to their own, you know, um, t- top 14 and premiership. And, you know, their playoffs will come later. And by all accounts, by all, by every, any, akin to football, it should be the last game of the season. It should be the ultimate. That European Cup final should come last, but it never has done and probably never will do out of the self-interest of the PRL and the LNR. Mm. So now we have the semi-finals foisted upon us at a week after the quarterfinals. But for 25,000 tickets who have already been sold, whoa, that suggests we could well have, it might even exceed last Saturday's 40,000 attendance at the Aviva. And like I said at the start of the show, Joan, we've talked about the atmosphere at the Aviva plenty. Um, it doesn't have to be full to have a great atmosphere. And I think the sea of red that greeted Munster last Saturday and the extraordinary atmosphere and the singing of songs and everything about the way they, they inspired the team. I think it's up now to the Leinster fans to emulate that and make it an even a bigger attendance and a sea of blue, um, even though they only have a week to do it. Or five well, look, days. They better, or there'll be a Jerry, Jerry Thornley column on a Wednesday calling them out, you know, nothing sure. Tuesday, Tuesday, Joe, Tuesday. Tuesday, of course. Um, by the way, just before we wrap, so Racine against La Rochelle, most seem to be tipping La Rochelle away from home to beat Racine here. But if people didn't see this game, uh, two just ridiculously fun tries. Uh, one, Finn Russell ball bouncing towards him and he decides, sod this, I'm going to volley it rather than catch it. Chase after it, volley it again <laughs> and uh, scores a try. But the Teddy Toma try on Whoa. the sideline, I don't know if you saw it, Liam, Jerry, I said, your reaction suggests you did. I mean, um, I was watching a studio with Shane Horgan, Liam, and like he understands the pressure of that sideline and how difficult it is. If you haven't seen the Teddy Tomat try, I think we can all recommend it. Like, that's what I said earlier on, Joe. What a weekend of rugby. Yeah. The, the London Irish, number 23, what was his name, who scored for 100 metre? Uh, a rundle or something? He ran from yeah. uh, the end of the world anyway. Yeah, I'm guessing so he was in hard open surgery after the lung bursting effort. Was, that was phenomenal. But we were treated, like, to, to Jerry's point, like, if everyone had said uh, the Aviva Stadium uh, this weekend, the weekend of rugby in Trinidad is going to really get people back. They're all supporters were, were rewarded. And that try, Teddy Tomat try, was just simply wonderful. Keeping on the pitch play, knowing how to add value to the ball and ultimately scoring it. It was a wonderful skill set, athleticism, uh, spatial awareness, which is something we used to talk about way back, understanding where you are in a moment. And he showed it at Plum. It was a fantastic score. Yeah, it sure was. It sure was. Uh, Jerry, final word to you. Whisper it, but uh, all our bemoaning, I think this tournament's caught fire. 
Yeah. It always does with the quarterfinal. And I always felt it would do. And the, I don't think the two legged last 16, round of 16, um, fail either. They brought out some, there was one or two foregone conclusions come the second legs, but there was about four epic ties as well, which went, went pretty much to the wire. And I think that worked. But quarter final weekend, for some reason, it always delivers. Everybody just has a go. It was brilliant memories, brilliant matches. Whereas the semi finals and certainly the finals are that little bit more traditional, tighter. I don't know, it's as if players are just that little, because the stakes just have increased, that they're just a little bit more um, afraid of making mistakes. Come the semi final, the final, I don't know. I don't think that'll be the case in the Aviva. No. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a brilliant, brilliant weekend for rugby. Um, and I think hopefully next weekend will be pretty good too. It's amazing to think that the, the pop concerts have had such an effect on this tournament. Ed Sheeran moved into Thoman Park and then, by God, I don't know how good, I don't care how good Ed Sheeran was, but it can't have been a patch on that monster to lose game. And then next Saturday, I think uh, Genesis are playing in La Defense Arena. That's why <laughs> that the game it is. Been, I wasn't sure who it was. Yeah, okay. that's why the game has been moved to uh, Lons, which yes. uh, you know, those will, will ring a... a, a yeah. Loud bell for Irish rugby <laughs> fans as well. But like, it's amazing. It's like, personally, if Genesis or Ed Sheeran were playing in the back garden, I'd go for a walk with my headphones. But anyway, each their own. Each their own is right. Well, I can't imagine either semi final is going to be a tight, tense affair. Tense, but not tight with these four teams. Fellas, thanks so much. Much appreciated. Jerry Thorny of the Irish Times. Liam Tolan, thank you as well. Take care, guys. There we are. So, uh, like I mentioned, Red 78. Uh, available from tomorrow, talking all things Munster with Alan Quinlan and Nate Briggs. We have built up right across the week to these amazing two games at the weekend. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us.